And uh, a lot of time people say, well, TJ, how did you get to where you got to? But what they don't know, I was born on the south side of Chicago. Uh, come from the gangs, uh, you know, the gangster disciples, insane disciples. And my mom was a junkie. My mom was a, a dope addict, and she brought me and two of my sisters from the south side of Chicago to Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, never knew my father, never knew my father, never knew who he was. And uh, But at that time, I began to sell drugs and deal drugs at 90 years old. And uh, eventually, I made my ranks throughout the gangs, throughout the hierarchy in the gang world and to the, in, in the drug world. And by the time I was 15 years old, I had accumulated over half a million dollars. I've seen someone shot uh, quite a few times. Shot, stabbed, beat up. I remember one closely, you know, that died in my arm. I, he was stabbed. And by the time I got to the scene, when the ambulance got there, he was, he was dead. I had this hard, rough life. I had this no, no, no parent, no, uh, no mother there. You know, never had anyone to come to a school to see me in a school play. I had no parental support. Uh, never. I've always been out. So the gangsters became my family. So those are the guys who helped me make my decision through life as being a gangster. So my whole thing, that's all I wanted to be. And so from 15, from 15 years old on up to now, you know, it was like, you know, I did everything. And I ended up facing, at 19, I ended up facing a 35 year life sentence. You know, that was my lifestyle. And I had a, I, had, I seen a whole lot of things when I was young. But facing 35 years to life, going in the penitentiary. The prosecutor told me, uh, when I was in court, he said, I wish I could charge you with murder because all you've done was destroy people's lives. But I was there on the drug charge, drug trafficking. I had a cell phone company and uh, I actually sold her cell phone. And I met her on a parking lot. And uh, the first time I saw her, I, I knew that it was just something about her. I just knew that I want to stay in, in touch with her. So I began to befriend myself to her. So eventually she took my calls and we, and we talked and everything. So we, we became friends. And uh, she had no idea about my lifestyle, being a gangster and drug dealer and all that. So one day somebody seen me with her that she knew. And he happened to be uh, a narcotic agent. He was like, do you know who you with? Came and told her, you know, do you know who that guy is? Do you have any clue? You know, she was like, no, oh, just a guy I met, you know, just a cool guy. She said, no. And I was like, no, nah, he lying on me. He must like, he must be attracted to you, no such a thing, you know. So, but eventually she found out. And at that time, she started to pray for me. Cause she saw something in me uh, that I didn't see in myself. And when my brother was killed, I vowed to kill the guys who killed my brother. And that's all I know. If you kill five of mine, I'm gonna kill 10 of yours. So when I brought, my brother got killed in Atlanta. Okay, he was, it was, he was on gangland. And they found my brother's body. My brother was killed with three other guys. The first thing they did was shot off four of my brother's fingers. Then they shot off his left shoulder. Then they shot off the left side of his head. Okay, and what the detectives told the family, my family was that they were trying to get him to talk, but he never did. So they tortured him, boom, 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 boom. Then they knew he wasn't gonna talk, so boom. Then I got a call and said, hey man, we know where these guys are. We know who they are. We got some information with the guy who shot my brother in the head Actually, uh, I had a picture of himself that fell off in the blanket they had my brother rolled up in. They had my brother rolled up in a blanket, two trash bags, and threw him in a garbage can. So this guy was walking this pit bull. The pit bull snatched away and, they, and it smelled my brother's blood. My brother had been dead for five days. So we knew who it was. I knew where they, I knew where they hung out at. I knew the whole thing, you know. And at that time, my wife's brother, we wasn't married yet, but her brother got killed seven months within my brother's death. And this is the scripture that turned everything. She said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. My wife used to always say, vengeance is the Lord's. Let him do it. My mother-in-law told me to go back. And I, it was Psalms 27 says, wait on the Lord. I see it, wait on the Lord. That's at the end of Psalms 27. That scripture stopped me from killing 11 people. At this time, I'm still smoking blunts, I'm drinking Hennessy, I'm doing all this. And I had an out-of-body experience. This is a true story. Um, I, I went through the hardest time of my life. I had a whole lot of family issues going on. So I had this big house in the suburbs of Memphis with cameras all around them. This house had a big patio. 
I was sitting against the patio door. I, I had a chair that I used to sit in, but I wasn't. I was just sitting by the door on on the floor, and I just had my head down. But I remember grabbing the Bible and just holding the Bible, and I cried in it. And the first thing that I, I the first time in my life I ever opened a Bible, I opened it up to the passage, true story, where Paul was knocked down on Damascus Road. And I said, God, I, I don't know you. I, I, I have no clue who Christ is. If you are real Christ, come into my life today, show me. But if you've done this for, for Paul, then, then do it for me. I had an out of body experience like the old man got up. He caught out a whole shot. Walked out of my side patio door. Walked through the door, vanished. And I never seen him again. From that point on, man, I told at the end, my fiance, I told him what I had, had experienced when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I started speaking in tongues. They were like, okay, it's, it's here. And they said, well, what's, what happened? And so I began to tell them the story, but I really couldn't paint the picture for them. And all I know is I saw the old man walk out the side of my patio door and I've never seen him again. From, from that point on, I started fasting and praying. I had no idea how I was gonna make it. I had no idea what was the next move. So I separated from my gang for oh, maybe over two years. Uh, I know it was like maybe 24, 25 months. Uh, I stopped smoking and drinking and I fasted from no, from no meat, no bread, no pasta, no sweet. I did that for two years and four months. So once I began to learn the beginning of reading, I stayed in the book. I stayed in the book of Acts because now I'm relating to Paul as a gangster. This dude right here, God let this dude live. You know what I'm saying? And I ain't did nothing compared to him, to me. But he let this dude live. So I got to research this dude. I got to find out who this gangster is. If I'm speaking or teaching even around the country, folks are like, oh man, you sound like Paul. They've always said that. You sound like the Apostle Paul, you know, uh, but because that, that's what happened to me. And it stopped me from killing 11 people. And so now today, as I sit before your listening audience and to you, it's been 15 years and four months that I've been doing prevention, intervention, law enforcement, faith-based and community awareness. And so every time I get a chance to speak, to preach, to teach, to motivate, to encourage, because I know life, you know, is redemption. I'm living my dream because I get to talk to children. Then I get to talk to people. So it's like I'm ministering, but I'm just hiding behind the title of prevention intervention specialist. But I get a chance to pray for folks. It's just like before I left Memphis, we have what we call the Youth Crime Watch. I just minister to over a thousand children, law enforcement. I get a chance to pray and talk. I have a casket there. I bring a casket in and put a mirror inside of the casket. And I have people to walk by and look at it and say, man, I supposed to have been here a long time ago, but praise be to God, I'm here. And in my sock right now, as we stand in this studio, I got a sock full of anointing oil because I pass out anointing oil all day long with a mustard seed in it. Because if we have the faith of a mustard seed, I don't see, I don't supposed to be here. All I got to do is look back over my life and see how far God has brought me. 35 years of life, 10 years of parole, and to be sitting in your studio talking about the Holy Ghost, to talking about the Holy Spirit. Man, I've been around the world three times and spoke to everybody twice. When I'm sitting up in Washington, D.C., man, talking to senators and talking to congressmen and telling them this is how we can fix America, then you know there's a God.